Welcome to our discussion on cervical cancer. Previous section, we talked about cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. We also talked about pap smears. Very, very, very important stuff for working in general practice because it's going to be, the onus is going to be on you to make sure that a woman gets her pap smear every year. And pap smears are very, very protective against cervical cancer uh, because all cervical cancers will start out as some kind of intraepithelial neoplasia, at least the squamous cell carcinomas. And so if we can pick up on those before it turns into cervical cancer, then we will be able to prevent cervical cancer in many cases. Uh, so I recommend watching that video. It's very continuous with this video. A 46-year-old woman presents to your clinic complaining of mild postcoital bleeding. This has been going on for about the past nine months. Normally, she says she's reluctant to see a doctor, but this has been getting worse. She tells you that this is the first time she's been in the clinic in 15 years when she had strep. She's null Paris and is monogamous with her husband of 20 years. She denies any other symptoms. We'll just add here that she has no significant past medical history. She's not on any medications. You do a physical exam, it reveals a one centimeter painless cervical mass. There is no uterosacral nodularity and the uterus is antiverted and freely mobile. No other masses are appreciated. On speculum, you note a red friable lesion over the transition zone extending over uh, into the endocervix. Pap smear is performed and returns as squamous cell carcinoma. Colposcopy is performed and biopsy returns as invasive cervical cancer. All right, so you know what this patient has, obviously. Um, the, ver the, the next step is going to be, since we know she has invasive cervical cancer, the next step is going to be to stage her because that's going to uh, determine how we go about treating her. What are some things that lead you to think cervical cancer before you even do the clinical examination? Well, her chief complaint is postcoital bleeding. Lots of things can cause postcoital bleeding. I would say uh, one of the more common things that can cause postcoital bleeding, especially in a woman her age, would be uh, a cervical polyp. And cervical polyps look somewhat like cervical cancers. Cervical polyps are much more common. Uh, and even if you just do this physical examination, it looks a lot like a cervical polyp. It's a red lesion, maybe bleeding a little bit around the transition zone, comes out of or extends in, doesn't, don't really know the difference, uh, in, into the endocervix, and that looks just like a cervical polyp. A really good gynecologist will be able to kind of be able to tell the difference on some level, but most people can't. So it looks a lot like a cervical polyp. Now, what do we do for cervical polyps? Let's say that's what we think this is. What we do for a cervical polyp is we do a pap smear, and that's going to be the next step no matter what. So we do a pap smear, it returns as squamous cell carcinoma. Now, not all cervical cancers are going to return on pap smear as squamous cell carcinoma. Some may return as high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, or ASK-H, uh, atypical squamous cell, uh, can't rule out high-grade uh, SIL. So that this tells us here that this is likely cervical cancer, invasive cervical cancer. But the next step is going to be colposcopy. When do we do colposcopy? We do it for any pap smear that's abnormal except for ASCUS. With ASCUS, we will get an HPV DNA test first. If it comes back high risk, then we will do colposcopy and biopsy. Uh, but for anybody else, you do colposcopy and biopsy. Colposcopy is done, you get a biopsy, it comes back as invasive cervical cancer. The only way we can tell if something's invasive cervical cancer is by getting histology. You can't tell by physical exam, you can't tell by pap smear, you need to get a biopsy. And that goes for practically any cancer. You have to get a biopsy first. What are some things in this patient's history that lead us to believe that it is possibly cervical cancer? Well, first off, she has not had a pap smear in at least 15 years. Uh, it would be good to ask her when her last pap smear was, uh, but we know she hasn't been in a clinic in 15 years. And even out of women that do go to the clinic, even see a, a general practitioner every year for physical exam, not all of them get pap smears. I don't know what the statistics are, but there are a lot of women that see a doctor that don't get pap smears. Why? Because there are some doctors that think that, well, it's not really my job. She's 
let the gynecologist deal with this. But the problem is not all women see gynecologists. Some just see their general practitioner. And so even if you're not doing the pap smear, if she sees a gynecologist, then yeah, maybe let the gynecologist do the pap smear. But you need to at least ask her if she's getting a pap smear, and if so, is your gynecologist taking care of it? Otherwise, the onus is on you to get the pap smear. She needs to get a pap smear every year, uh, sometimes every three years. At, starting at age 21, women are going to get pap smears every single year until they're 30. And at that point, they might be able to get a pap smear every three years, uh, but it really depends on their history. We talk about this more in the other section, so if you want more information on that, you can go back there. Another thing here uh, that I put in just uh, for your information, when you got the physical exam, you saw sort of a red, friable, maybe bleeding mass. This is what that looked like. What else could that be? Well, it could be endometriosis. Uh, now, probably not because she doesn't complain of any cyclical pelvic pain, and the physical exam is normal. So what do we normally see with endometriosis, or at least in many cases? You can get some uterosacral nodularity. Sometimes you can feel some nodularity on rectal exam. Uh, a lot of cases with endometriosis, the uterus will be retroverted and fixed. Uh, in this case, the uterus is antrover antroverted and freely mobile, which is um, consistent with no endometriosis. That doesn't mean that it can't be endometriosis, but this is consistent with a patient who does not have endometriosis. Uh, and either way, you have a patient that presents with a red friable bleeding mass. Uh, she needs to get a pap smear. Okay, Even if you think that this might be a polyp, and it very well could be, uh, you still need to get a pap smear. And this is why we do pap smears on women, even if we think they have a cervical polyp. Now, if it happened to be a polyp, I talked about that in another section, but if it were a polyp, we would go ahead and remove this. Um, but because this is cancer, we need to do uh, a biopsy, and then we can look at possibly removing it, uh, depending on the stage. But she may need chemoradiation, she may need uh, a radical hysterectomy, it really just depends on the stage. And that's why we need to stage it, too. So cervical neoplasia and malignancy, we're going to talk about the epidemiology, some interesting facts there. We'll talk about the human papillomavirus, which is causative of cervical, uh, at least squamous cell cancer of the cervix, presentation, staging, and management. So here's the anatomy of the female genital tract. I included a more detailed view of the anatomy here because there are some places where these tumors can spread, namely uh, this region here called the parametrium. Uh, which is the external lining of the female genital tract, which ultimately is going to go into the broad ligament. Now you have a parametrium of the cervix, and it's important to understand the existence of a parametrium because if you have parametrial invasion, that is going to necessitate, in all cases, chemoradiation. If, it, if there is no... Uh, parametrial invasion, and it's confined enough, in some cases you can get by with just doing surgery. There's some disagreement there. Uh, different, there are, are different recommendations, uh, but it's important to understand the concept of parametrium because everybody agrees that if there's parametrial invasion, you need to do chemoradiation. Uh, so here's our cervix here. Uh, you have the external os, which opens into the vagina. You have the cervical canal and then the internal os. Average diameter of the cervix is approximately one centimeter, maybe a little bit less. And then uh, the average length is about four centimeters or roughly the size of your pinky finger. About 12,990 new cases of invasive cervical cancer will be diagnosed in the U.S. Uh, this year. About 4,120 women will die from cervical cancer. This is a lot better than it used to be. Go back about 40 years, it was about 25,000 cases per year of invasive cervical cancer. And one of the reasons that it's gone down so much is because of regular pap exams. 12,990 is still unacceptable, and I would bet that many of those women Probably the majority of them do not get regular pap smears. And so it's so important to stress this to your patients and not only make sure they're getting pap smears, but that they're getting them on the schedule that they're supposed to be getting them. 
so that they're getting a pap smear every year or uh, every three years. But you want to make sure if they need to get it every year that they're getting it every year. Cervical cancer is the third most common malignancy in women worldwide overall. Uh, it's the second most common in developing countries and the tenth most common in industrialized countries. Why the differential there? It all has to do with PAPs. Women in, in, in developing countries are not going to get PAP smears as often in women in developed countries where we have better health care. It is also the second most common cause of cancer death in women in developing countries, but it's not even in the top 10 in industrialized countries. So big, big, big disparity here. And again, it all has to do with PAP. So in industrialized countries, there's roughly four to 10 cases per every 100,000 women. In, in countries in sub-Saharan, uh, sub Eastern Africa, there's about three to eight times that, 34.5 cases per 100,000 women. So huge, huge disparity. Cervical cancer can present at any age. It's more common to present, invasive cervical cancer is more common to present in older women over the age of 40, especially in the range of 50 to 79 years of age, but it can present in anybody. Okay, There are young women that die of cervical cancer too. So anybody, and this is why we start screening for cervical cancer very early on, why we do pap smears early on. The prevalence among women under the age of 40 is increasing. Why is that? Probably because of more sexual promiscuity. Uh, the more sexual promiscuity, the more men a woman sleeps with, the more, uh, the, the more HPV strains she's going to be exposed to. And there are certain HPV strains that are worse than others, as we're going to see. Some cause cervical cancer, others cause condylomas. Uh, but the more men a woman sleeps with, the more likely she is to get one of those bad strains. And with men, HPV is relatively inconsequential. They don't have cervixes, so they're not going to get cervical cancer. In general, for a long time, we haven't been worried about men and boys carrying HPV because there's really not a lot of consequences to it. Now we are actually immunizing boys and men uh, against HPV because we're not so worried about them, we are worried about their wives and the women that they sleep with. In the U.S., whites and Asians have better survival than other racial groups. Probably not genetic, probably has to do with better quality of care uh, for these patients, higher socioeconomic status. So here you can see this comes out of California, but this is pretty uh, indicative, representative of uh, the general population in the U.S. You can see that there is a higher incidence of, uh, of, of cervical cancer in Hispanics, roughly more or less the same in everybody else. But if you look at the mortality, let's compare whites and blacks. The incidence is pretty close. However, the mortality for blacks is twice that of whites. Why is this? Don't know. Uh, probably has something to do with quality of care. Um, I can't imagine that there's any kind of, uh, any kind of genetic uh, susceptibility to dying from cervical cancer uh, in blacks versus whites. Um, so I'm not sure, uh, but I would say that it's probably a quality of care issue. Why such a high incidence among Hispanics? Not sure. Uh, but uh, for the most part with the deaths, it's pro it probably has something to do with quality of care. Now, what might explain the higher incidence of cervical cancer with Hispanics? It may have to do with PAPs, because here we're talking about cervical cancer incidence. And remember that with regular Pap smears, you can prevent uh, the progression of cervical enterepithelial neoplasia from going into invasive cervical cancer. So that may have something to do with Pap's. All right. So you can draw some information into that. If you look by state, you will see that cervical cancer is more prevalent in the South. Generally, the South is less healthier than the rest of the country. And so this is really not surprising. 
We also know that Hispanics have a higher, uh, a higher incidence of cervical cancer, and so you, uh, states that are uh, have high Hispanic population, including Texas, California, New York, New Jersey, they have higher incidences as well. Interestingly, you look at states with a higher white population, there's less incidence of cervical cancer, uh, and that probably has to do with quality of care. Uh, but if you look at West Virginia and Kentucky, which also have very high white populations, you note that their rates are just as bad as the South, and that has to do probably with poverty, uh, which there's a lot more poverty in those states. Worldwide, you can see what I was talking about. Sub-Saharan and East Africa, really, really bad. Places that are better include the U.S., uh, China, Australia, Western Europe, and the Middle East, interestingly. And if you look at the Middle East, they don't do a whole heck of a lot of immunization. Now, we're probably not going to see the effects of the immunization, the Gardasil vaccine, for a while, because remember, most invasive cervical cancers are in older women, so it'll probably take some time for us to see the results of that. Um, but uh, it's probably, you know, a lot of this, again, is probably a quality of care issue. But why in the Middle East? We know that there's really good quality of care in North America, in Australia, which you consider kind of like Europe. Um, but in the Middle East is not exactly known for the greatest quality of care. There's poverty there. Uh, there's, it's, I'm not knocking on any doctors out there. Believe me, I know I have a lot of followers in the Middle East. But there's, it's, it's not as wealthy an area, especially you talk about Afghanistan, Iran, Egypt, not as wealthy as Western Europe and the U.S. Why is the incidence lower there? It probably has to do with sexual practices. Women in general in that part of the world are not as promiscuous as in Western Europe and the United States, and so they're not as likely to be exposed to some of those worse strains of HPV. I'm just making a hypothesis here, but that may be what's behind it. Okay, so here we see the rate of HPV infection, which does not necessarily, it doesn't mean cancer, but it is a risk factor for cervical cancer, and then the cervical cancer cases. And what we see is that there's a very high prevalence of HPV infections in younger women, and then that kind of trails off. Uh, usually you can clear most HPV infections within a couple years of inoculation. Cervical cancer becomes more likely as you get older. Why that might be, some HPV infections will integrate into your DNA and they kind of remain, and then over time you can develop cervical cancer. Now this is also why you see the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia in younger women. Remember, even though cervical cancer is more common in older women over the age of 40, the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, CIN, is more common in younger women in their 20s. Uh, and that probably has to do with the fact that they have more acute HPV infections. Survival of cervical cancer is inversely correlated with age. So if you have, if you're diagnosed with cervical cancer and you're young, you are more likely to survive than if you're old. And what that probably has to do with, again here, is surgery. You're, you do better in surgery if you're younger. Chemotherapy, you can be a little bit more aggressive with chemotherapy in patients who are younger. And then in general, as you get older, your immune system starts to trail off. And a good immune system is protective against cervical cancer. Okay, so here's some notable cervical cancer deaths. Uh, the woman on the right here is Jay Goody. She's a UK uh, reality TV star. Note her age. She was only 28 when she died. Uh, so young women can die of cervical cancer too. This is Eva Perone. If you ever watched the musical Evita, it was based off of her. She was the uh, wife of Argentinian dictator Juan Perón. And interestingly, his second wife after her also died of cervical cancer. So where, where, where do you think, who do you think was responsible for that? He probably carried a bad HPV strain and gave it to both of his wives who developed cervical cancer. So not for sure on that, didn't do any forensic examinations, but put two and two together. 
This is Joey Feek. She was a recent uh, victim of cervical cancer. She was a singer. Again, here, look at her age. She was only 40 years old. So, very young. Tragic death. A lot of these are preventable with regular pap smears. And now what we have... Oh, we're not going to talk about that yet. I was going to go on to Gardasil, but we're going to briefly talk about HPV. So HPV, it's a DNA virus. Human papillomavirus is causally linked with the development of cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, as well as invasive cervical cancer. And it is also linked to other types of squamous cell cancer, anal cancer, vulvar cancer, head and neck squamous cell cancer. So there is a link between this virus, for some reason, and these cancers. And what this virus does is it's, it will insert its genome into the host genome, and that can cause cancer. DNA fragments of HPV have been found incorporated into the DNA cells of 80% of CIN lesions and 90% of cervical cancers. I'm not sure here if they're talking just about the squamous cell cervical cancers. I should note that 80% of cervical cancers are squamous cell cancers. The other 20% are adenocarcinomas, which are a little bit different. We can still test for that on PAP, though. Not all HPVs are the same. So you have HPVs 6 and 11. These serovars are low risk. They are more likely to cause condyloma. On the other hand, HPV 16, 18, all the ones in the 30s and 45, they are higher risk. These are the ones that we are worried about when we, for instance, test a woman who came back positive for ASCUS with an HPV DNA test. We can see what HPV strain she carries, if any. And if it's one of these higher risk HPVs, those are the women we do colposcopy and biopsy on. Now, it is becoming more and more common practice to get HPV DNA as part of screening for women. I uh, have not read a whole lot of literature on that. Um, I believe the test, USMLE, will ask you the classic PAP. Uh, just you do a PAP. When do you get an HPV DNA? You get it on a woman who has ASCUS. Uh, however, uh, it is good as a clinical side to know that we do this HPV DNA test now as part of screening. Uh, I believe if you get the HPV DNA test, then in some cases you only need to get a pap smear every five years. Um, and X amount, I'm not sure how many, I think it's two consecutive normal HPV DNA tests. You can discontinue paps in some cases in older women. I'm not exactly sure how that meshes into the uh, the PAP guidelines, but I talked about the PAP guidelines in, in the other section, so you can go back and look at that. Uh, but it is becoming more and more common now to get HPV DNA as part of a screening program. Most HPV will be cleared within a couple years of infection. However, at least 80% of sexually active women will have acquired a genital HPV infection by age 50, regardless of whether they've cleared it or not. What this has implications on is why immunocompromised women are more likely to develop cervical cancer than immunocompetent women. If you can't clear the HPV, it's going to be more likely to incorporate into your DNA. If it incorporates into your DNA, you're more likely to get cancer. Note that there are a lot of women that get HPV. Most of them clear it. Uh, most For most of them, it's a low-risk serovar, and so they don't go on to develop cancer. All right, uh, so this is the screening or the progression of cervical neoplasia. So note here, normally, if you get, were to get a histology, uh, you have squamous epithelium, you have this mid-zone here, you have a basal layer, then you have basement membrane. Uh, when you get infection, note that you need to have some level of abrasion. So uh, the HPV virus, it does not attach to healthy tissue. It has to be denuded to some degree. That's not difficult. If you're having sexual intercourse, the penis can easy, easily cause a, a micro trauma uh, that can then uh, lead the tissue to be uh, susceptible to infection. So the virus gets in, it causes, uh, it, in some cases you'll have natural clearance, but in other cases it will invade the cells. When the cells become invaded, you can develop CIN. CIN can progress based on the depth of invasion of these abnormal cells. 
Ultimately, if it invades the basement membrane, now you have cervical cancer. So I talked about CIN1 through CIN3, as well as uh, uh, carcinoma in situ uh, in the previous section. With cervical cancer, you have invasion of the basement membrane. That is the definition of cervical cancer. When we say invasive cervical cancer, we're talking about invasion of the basement membrane. What do we have now? In the last 15 years, a vaccine has come out onto the market called Gardasil. What do we mean by Gardasil? They probably mean guard against squamous intraepithelial lesions. That's probably where that comes from. If not, it's a really good mnemonic. But Gardasil, it is a vaccine against HPV. And up until recently, the only vaccine we've had is a quadrivalent vaccine that uh, the protected against 6, 11, 16, and 18, which are the most common ones. 6 and 11 cause the warts. 16 and 18 can cause the cancer. Now we have a non-avalent Gardasil, and that protects against even more. Uh, now, together, 16 and 18 make up about 70% of cancers. Uh, but now we have this non-avalent where you can get uh, even better protection. So there's now the Gardasil 9, and we'll see a picture of that, but that is what's becoming uh, more used because it's, it's got better protection. That just came out a few years ago. So Gardasil is a vaccine. It uh, is composed of recombinant virus-like particles. No DNA in the vaccine. All this is is the particles that sit on the outside of the virus. And so the idea is if you expose the patient to these particles that sit on the outside. You can have an antibody response, and then once the HPV is introduced uh, during sexual contact, you have the antibodies which can quickly eliminate the virus from the system. Because it is just the virus-like particles, there's no viral DNA involved with, uh, with this vaccine, it is perfectly safe for use in immunocompromised women, and very important to use it in them, because remember, they're already at high risk for cervical cancer, and you can also use it in lactating women. How do we give this? When do we give this? It is routinely recommended for girls and boys aged 11 to 12 years, and you need to know that you have to give three doses over a six-month period of time. So before you give the first dose, make sure you ask the parent, are you gonna get your child in two more times in the, in the next six months, because if they can't, then you need to just do it later. When they can get in three times in six months, make sure that you, know, you have your computer handy, schedule them for visits right away so that they know when they're coming in. You make sure that you're, they're getting three doses in six months, because if they don't, it's not as effective. So we prefer to do this at 11 to 12 years. The reason is because we believe it has higher efficacy long-term if we give it younger. You know, 11 to 12 years. It can be given as early as nine years. We try not to go later than 26 years. With boys, if they're older than 21, we typically don't give it. It doesn't have really good efficacy. However, there is a subset of the male population that we do give uh, the vaccine up to 26 years as we would for females, and that would be men who have sex with men. It would also be, I believe, intravenous drug users that don't quote me on that. Uh, possibly even immunocompromised men too, I would say for sure. Uh, so that is how we give Gardasil. So give it early, 11 to 12 years when we prefer to give it, usually that middle school physical around then, uh, and then make sure you give three doses over a six month period of time. If a teenager comes in, even college age kid comes in, 18, 19 years old, yes, give Gardasil. Having it is better than not having it. But usually after 26, it doesn't make much of a difference. Okay, now there is going to be a certain population of patients, and really they're more so parents, that are going to be very suspicious of vaccinating their children. And a lot of that has to do with the whole vaccine hysteria in general. I'm sure you've dealt with it. Parents think vaccines can cause all sorts of things like autism and uh, I, everything under the sun, they think, can be from vaccines. And it's really unfortunate because it's misinformation. Misinformation gets spread on the internet, in these Facebook social groups, uh, message boards, and everything online, and it's 
really unfortunate uh, that people are allowed to spread this kind of misinformation because we're seeing measles and mumps that are now having outbreaks. And just recently in the National Hockey League, uh, there were, was an outbreak of mumps. <laughs> Why? We have a vaccine against that. Everybody is supposed to get their MMR vaccine. Why do we have mumps? Probably because there are certain people not getting their vaccines. Kids are getting these old diseases again, and it's because they're not getting vaccinated. And then they might think that, well, everybody else, uh, no, nobody else has it. Mumps is so uncommon. Measles is so uncommon. Polio is so uncommon. Why do I need to get it? Well, the reason it's uncommon is because people are getting their vaccines. It's called herd immunity. And if everybody stops getting their vaccines, people are going to start getting it again. And there are certain patients that can't be vaccinated. And that is immunocompromised patients. There are certain vaccines, MMR being one of them, uh, that they, they can't receive. And so they're constantly at the mercy of people who get their vaccines because they then won't carry it. That's herd immunity. Now, that being said, immunocompromised patients can get Gardasil. But this is just uh, uh, this is important in general because you have these pa patients, these parents, who think vaccines are the devil. They're not. They think vaccines contain mercury. They don't. Now, you will have a set of parents that are generally okay with vaccines, but Gardasil makes them a little nervous. Why? Because Gardasil protects against HPV, and we believe, uh, we know HPV is a virus that can be transmitted sexually. So what they will think then is that this vaccine is to help my child against STDs, and I am raising my child to be a good Christian, or I am raising my child to be a good Muslim, and therefore they're not going to have sex until they get married. So why do they need this needless vaccine? What you need to do to make sure that they are aware of why this vaccine is so important is to give them information that uh, will lead them to believe the truth, and the truth is that you can get cervical cancer without being a whore. Okay, we'll put it that way. Okay, not just promiscuous women get cervical cancer. Women who are monogamous in monogamous relationships get cervical cancer. So what do you what should you tell them? First of all, HPV can be acquired at any point in life, including during a monogamous relationship like marriage. A woman could get married to a man who carries HPV 16. She's never had sex in her life. She gets married, husband has HPV 16, he gives it to her, she develops cervical cancer. Okay? It happens all the time. So that's one thing to tell them. You don't have to have promiscuous sex to get HPV and get cervical cancer. Also, the vaccine is not as effective if received later in life. So if, for instance, you were to change your mind, but now your kid is 24, or they were to change their mind, it's not as effective as if they were to get it now. Just because we're giving it to 11 and 12-year-olds does not mean we expect 11 and 12-year-olds to get HPV. We're, we don't think they're having sex, some of them might, but that's not why we give it at 11 to 12 years of age. We give it to those patients because they are most likely to have an optimal response to the vaccine so that when they do hit the age of having sex or getting married and having sex, that they are not, uh, they have the greatest likelihood of mounting an immune response and ultimately not developing cancer. And then also, the vaccine can be effective against other HPV-mediated disorders, including head and neck squamous cell cancer, which we don't associate with sexual intercourse. So here are countries that don't have national HPV vaccinations. Here are countries that do. You can see the industrialized world does have them for the most part. The uh, non-industrialized world and Asia uh, they don't. And that is a problem because where is HPV, uh, where is cervical cancer a problem? It's a problem here in South Africa, so Southern Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. There is a concerted effort now to get Gardasil out to these places. And there really needs to be because this is where they have the biggest problem. This is Gardasil 9. This is the new nonavalent vaccine. 
which protects against 6, 11, 16, 18, 31, 33, 45, 52, 58. How does cervical cancer present? So remember that cervical intraepithelial neoplasia is more likely to present in young women. They'll have abnormal PAPs, but they don't have cervical cancer as much. Invasive cervical cancer is more likely to present in older women. However, the rates are increasing in younger women, and cervical cancer is one of the more common gynecologic cancers in the young. So all that means is that it's becoming more prevalent in younger women, we're hoping that the Gardasil will lower that. It will take some time to see uh, how much it does. Uh, but then also, out of all the gynecologic cancers, cervical cancer is the one that's more likely to present in a younger woman. Ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer, not as common in younger women. Risk factors, early intercourse. The earlier on you have sex, the earlier on you are exposed to HPV. Uh, and generally, women who have sex earlier on in life are more likely to have sex more in life. Early childbearing, that really just has to do with early intercourse. If you're bearing a child early on in life, you probably had intercourse early on in life. High-risk partners. If you have sex, if you're a woman who has sex with a man who has sex with multiple other women or uh, a bisexual man who may get HPV from a man who doesn't know he has it, uh, it could be a really bad strain, then you are at greater risk. Uh, low socioeconomic status probably has something to do with lower quality of care, uh, so they're not getting pap smears. History of STIs probably, again, is a surrogate for frequent intercourse. Uh, by frequent, I mean... Uh, I mean promiscuity. I don't mean frequent intercourse with your husband. Uh, so that might be a, it. Might be a surrogate for that. But also, STIs can cause cervicitis. Cervicitis makes the cervix more. Uh, it's it's injured, so you can get HPV infection a lot easier. Cigarette smoking. We know it's an independent risk factor, uh, along with HPV. And so, not really sure exactly why that is. And then immunodeficiency is another big one. Your immune system is supposed to clear out HPV. Symptoms. Early disease, typically asymptomatic. When there is a symptom, the most common one is postcoital bleeding, but that can be a symptom of many different things. Uh, one of the more common ones, as we mentioned, is a cervical polyp, which looks a lot like cervical cancer on physical exam. Other symptoms can include watery discharge, pretty nonspecific. Pelvic pain and pressure, if it gets big enough, this mass is in the cervix, and so it doesn't take a whole lot of, uh, of, a, of a mass to cause pressure in the cervix in that region, uh, which is a pretty narrow region to begin with. And then rectal or urinary tract symptoms. And cervical cancer can invade the rectal mucosa, the bladder mucosa. At that point, it's a stage four cervical cancer. Um, so if you're having rectal or urinary tract symptoms, that is a very, very bad sign. Physical exam. You do your bimanual exam, which you should do first. Uh, you may appreciate a cervical mass but maybe not. Very early on, cervical cancer is microscopic. Uh, but it doesn't take long, and you can get uh, a, a gross lesion. So you may appreciate a cervical mass. We did in this patient, so she's probably a stage 1 or 2. Um, or stage 2, maybe. Uh, so invasive lesions to the upper vagina, not uncommon. Uh, Cul-de-sac may be affected. Uh, here we're, we're just talking further out, so stage is probably going to be higher, um, and then the adnexa, uh, which here we're including the parametrum. Speculum examination. What do you see? Friable bleeding cervical lesion, uh, which may invade other parts of the vagina, but it also might just appear like, um, like you would expect um, an abnormal colposcopy, where you see... Uh, whitening of, of the lesions. Uh, if you exposed to acetic acid, you might see uh, abnormal vascularity. You might see uh, the stippling. Uh, so it really just depends. Pap smears. Do not diagnose cervical cancer. You should know this if you watched the last lecture. Pap smears are screening for cervical cancer. They tell you if you have abnormal cells. The only thing that diagnoses cervical cancer is biopsy. That will tell you if you have invasion of the basement membrane, which is really uh, 
the $100,000 question. Cervical cancer staging. So this is the only cancer, gynecologic cancer, that's staged clinically. The rest are staged surgically. What do we do? Uh, it's helpful to do a, an exam under anesthesia to get a really good look at the external uh, and uh, proximal female genital tract. You can do a cystoscopy and proctoscopy that will tell you if there's any invasion into those areas which sit right up against the cervix so they are liable to be invaded. IV pyelography will help you uh, visualize the urinary tract uh, and the kidneys. Uh, this is important because in some cases if there's invasion you can get uh, you can get hydronephrosis. Barium enema chest x-ray. Now you're not going to get all these necessarily, but these are some modalities that can be used in staging. MRI and CT are useful, but they don't, they're, they're not something that's going to tell us the stage by themselves. They're useful for visualizing masses if we suspect them, um, so they're good for confirmation, but you're never going to do an MRI or CT by itself and, and be able to stage it. You can't do it. Um, so it can help you determine the extent of the disease, can also help you determine if there are distant metastases, brain, lungs, uh, but it does not give you the particular stage by itself. So what are our stages? Pretty complex. I want to try to break this down and make it as easy as possible for just general board examinations. If you're a gynecologist, you need to know this probably in greater detail than I wrote this out on here. But uh, for USMLE, for most board examinations, there are just a couple points you need to know here. So stage zero, like most staging systems, just refers to in situ. There's no inv invasion. So this is just CIS. Stage one means you're strictly confined to the cervix. It's nowhere else. It's only in the cervix. This gets divided up into four different categories, 1A and 1B, and then uh, that can be further broken down into 1A1, 1A2, 1B1, 1B2. To make this simple, 1A is a microscopic lesion. So you don't see the actual lesion. You can't feel it. You can't see it. It's just microscopic. There's no tumor that's visible. So usually this is diagnosed with PAP, and histology, but you don't see anything. You don't see any visible tumor. And we can divide this into 1A1 and 1A2 based on depth. I can't remember the exact parameters. Don't worry about them. Okay, But you do need to know uh, that uh, this is divided up into 1A1 and 1A2, as we're going to see when we talk about treatment. 1B is gross lesions, and this is divided based on size. I believe it's... Uh, I can't remember. I don't want to be wrong here. Uh, so. 1B is gross lesions, 1B1 is smaller than 1B2. Okay, so that's stage one, strictly confined to the cervix. If the lesion, the tumor, has spread beyond the cervix, then it's going to be at least a stage two. Stage two means it's spread beyond the cervix, but it has not invaded the pelvic wall. So usually what we're talking about here is it's moved to the upper two-thirds of the vagina. And usually it's going to be the anterior vagina, the upper vagina. If you're looking, uh, if you're looking on uh, uh, with the speculum, so it's spread beyond the cervix, but not to the pelvic wall. And what we are most worried about here is whether or not there's parametrial involvement. If there's no parametrial involvement, it's 2A. If there is parametrial involvement, it's 2B. Why is parametrial involvement important to know? If there's parametrial involvement, in all cases, you're going to be doing chemo radiation. Okay. There are different recommendations, but everybody agrees that if there's parametrial involvement, if it's 2B or beyond, if it's stage 3 or stage 4, you're going to be doing chemo radiation. Before that, there's disagreement. We'll talk about that in the next slide. Stage 3 means that it's spread to the pelvic wall, or it's spread to the lower third of the vagina, or it's caused hydronephrosis or non-functioning of a kidney. And then finally, stage four means that it's spread beyond, outside the true pelvis, or it involves the mucosa of the bladder and or rectum. So you may hear stage, uh, stage zero and one uh, referred to as uh, pre, 
invasive, I believe they refer to it as uh, stage two and three. I believe they call it early and stage four late. Those are old and uh, those are archaic terms. Don't worry about it. Stage zero through stage four is what we use. So here's a uh, illustration that kind of shows you stage zero through stage four. Also tells you the five year survival. They most commonly present at stage one and two, which is good. They're more manageable, better survival. Occasionally, they'll present later on. How do we treat this? Okay, here's where I said that the recommendations may vary. I got this out of a review book. Uh, and the reason I'm using this one is because, one, it's out of a review book, so it's probably what the test will ask you. Uh, and also because it's simpler. Uh, now, here's where we're going to start. Stage 0 in situ uh, and stage 1A1, meaning microscopic lesion, smaller, can be managed with a cold knife quinization or a simple hysterectomy. Of course, make sure you take the cervix out. There are some hysterectomies where you leave the cervix. Obviously, you're not doing that here. Stage 1A2 and stage 2A, you're going to manage with a radical hysterectomy where you're taking out more than just the uterus or radiation. So a radical hysterectomy, you're taking out the uterus, you're taking out the parametria, you're taking out the upper vaginal cuff, you're going to remove the uh, uterosacral and cardinal ligaments, and you'll also remove the local vascular and lymphatic supplies. Stage 2B, so parametrial involvement and beyond, stage 3 and stage 4, must be managed with chemoradiation, and often some kind of surgery will be added as well. Okay, so having said that, some Gynecologic oncologists will start chemoradiation very early, even 1A2. Some may even start at 1A1. They may use chemoradiation for everybody, or at least chemotherapy for everybody, or maybe just radiation for everybody. It really depends on the gynecologist, um, the oncologist, whoever's taking care of the patient. But these are the recommendations I found in blueprints. I would imagine that this would be the most the test would ask you, even if, if they even go this far. What do we do as far as chemotherapy goes? For patients up to 4A, meaning that you don't have distant metastases, cisplatin and 5-fluorouracil are the drugs that are most commonly given. Those are, those are the recommendations everywhere I looked. So cisplatin, 5-fluorouracil. If it is metastatic, distant metastases, so that would be stage 4B, the most advanced form, or if you've given chemotherapy with cisplatin and 5-fluorouracil and you've had a recurrence, then there are a variety of ways you can go. Uh, usually it's going to involve cisplatin, but you're going to use other drugs besides 5 or so. Uh, so some, uh, I think they use bevacizumab, which is a monoclonal antibody. Uh, paclitaxel is also used, tapatican. So there are various different regimens. Don't worry about that. Uh, but you should know in general that uh, sorry about that. Okay, so you should know in general that when you have a patient with recurrent a recurrence of a cancer, you need to know you need to use a different chemotherapeutic uh, agent because what you have now is a clone of cells that are resistant to that uh, drug. Now, if a patient never received radiation and they have a recurrence, you can try radiation. So if you just did chemotherapy, or let's say it was a stage two A and you just did, did, did a radical hysterectomy you could try radiation. You could also try chemotherapy at that point. Um, so you can try things that you haven't tried before. Uh, and then you can also do pelvic exenteration, but we try to avoid that because there's so much morbidity and reduction of quality of life with doing pelvic exenteration. So it's really a barbaric surgery. Five-year survival, stage one, pretty good. 85 to 90%. Stage 2 drops precipitously, 65 to 70%. By the time you get to stage 3 and stage 4, they're more likely to be dead in 5 years than alive. 35 to 45% in stage 3. Stage 4 is 15 to 20%. So this just illustrates why you need to get pap smears. That's what I want you to take from all of this if you don't take anything else away. Why routine pelvic pap smears are very, 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 very important. And also why Gardasil is going to be very useful for patients to prevent them from developing cervical cancer. Those two things put together, I think, will reduce cervical cancer, uh, at least in industrialized countries, to the point where 
uh, we uh, don't see this a whole lot in the future. But as for now, we need to be worried about cervical cancer and we need to be worried about um, eradicating this to the greatest degree that we can. Any questions, write me a note below. We'll see you next time.